Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of No Limits. I am pleased to be joined by former Kansas City Royal shortstop buddy Bianca Lana. Thanks for being on the broadcast, buddy. My pleasure, Scott, and uh, so nice of you to have me. You're very welcome. Just let everybody know out there that number one, this show will run until nine o'clock Eastern time. So we have a lot of ground to cover. We always appreciate all the input in the chat room. Well, first of all, buddy, let's let's talk about your baseball career and the 1985 World Championship team. Your manager was Dick Hauser, quite the guy, George Brett, Hal McRae, Dan Quisenberry. What was it like having them as teammates and Hauser as your manager? Well, we had, uh, you know, we had a great team. Obviously, we won the, the World Series that year, and we were built around speed and defense and great starting pitching. We had uh, just enough hitting to get the job done. Thank God we had George Brett on the club. Um, but it was a good team, you know, re- really, uh, really solid guys. Dick Hauser was uh, wonderful to me. Put me in the lineup with about two weeks to go in the, in the season. Told me I was a shortstop and I played down the stretch, played well, then started all 14 postseason games. And uh, so it was a really, you know, I was very grateful for Dick for the opportunity he gave me to uh, to get in there at a very critical time for our, our club. Um, so it was it was really a, a memorable time in my life. You can imagine any time you win a World Series and growing up as a kid, you know, it's I never could even fathom playing in a World Series. I, I never, never thought about it. I, I always wanted to play in the major leagues and I was – uh, fortunate to have been able to do that, but never thought about playing the World Series. All of a sudden, we're in the World Series, and uh, <laughs> it was rather, uh, rather exciting event in my life. You can imagine. Yeah, let's talk about that. I know you played 35 games all season, and like you said, Dick Hauser benched Onyx Conception in favor of you, and obviously you became the shortstop. You had like 14 games where you had really no errors, for, you know, and your hit batting average wasn't bad, but 278 and your on base percentage by today's standards was 435 for those of people that are paying for it. So, you know, I think that was impressive, but yeah, let's talk about the world series. You played 13 to 15 games. And of course the team won the American league West over the California angels. That was quite a stretch one, wasn't it? It was amazing stretch run, you know, it was tight. We were neck and neck with the angels the whole way. Had a really big series with them in Kansas City uh, with about six days to go in the season. Um, very intense. You know, when you're in a pennant race, it's, uh, you know, every day is just a really, really big deal. We're playing to, you know, huge crowds. Um, you know, I remember not being able to sleep a lot. I'd end up sleeping on the couch just because I <laughs> tried to get some sleep. It's pretty pretty intense down the stretch with Major League Baseball season. You just don't get a break. You know, you're going after it every day, day in and day out. Right. Um, you know, I always said the, the neat thing about the playoffs in the World Series, those are huge games, but you get a day off. You get a few day off, days off during the, those series to kind of rest up a little bit and get a break. So, but, um, yeah, the Angels had a great club. You know, they, I mean, they were managed by Gene Mock, and they had, uh, I think Reggie was on the team, Doug DeSensei, Bobby Gritch, Brian Downing. Uh, I think Bob Boone was, was still catching in those days. And um, we had some battles, you know, so it was, it was neck and neck all the way to the all the way to the final day. I think we beat, uh, not the final day. I think we beat Oakland uh, on the day before the end of the season to clinch it. So it was uh, an exciting time. Kara Katz out there mentions that. Uh, don't forget about Brett Saberhagen. No, I won't forget about him. He was an important part. George Eichhorn, I'm going to go through the chat, and then we're going to get to the main event. The Coffins did a great job developing Kansas City as a legit baseball t- town, no doubt about that. I'm just reading them off to you. And, of course, Will Vogel, a constant contributor. Was there a certain player you modeled your game after? Yeah, you know, um, being called up and and playing next to George Brett and having Hal McCray on the club, those are two guys that really, in my opinion, played the game the right way and, and, you know, just were kind of uh, an influence on me. This is how you play. You slide hard every base you go into. Even though I was a shortstop, I'll tell you what, I went in there trying to tear up every shortstop that I slid into. I wasn't afraid to get hit myself and really never got hit uh, playing defense. But those two guys were they exemplified, in my opinion, how the game was played. Uh, George was a real leader on the field. Howe was more of a leader on the field and off the field in the clubhouse. Howe was a guy that was, uh, you know, a lot of fun, really cutting up in the clubhouse and was always in your corner. But, you know, if you needed a kick in the butt, he was going to give it to you. You know, he really would get on guys pretty hard. Um, to, you know, to, to really get you going. And, and uh, 
tremendous admiration for Al McRae. Well, Vogel mentions that he's been looking forward to the show since I posted it. All right, so let's go on to one other baseball thing. I want to really get to what you're doing now. This is really, really important. You know, let's just talk about basically the rule changes in MLB stemming from the ghost runner, the three batter minimum, the pitch clock, the larger bases, et cetera. Just give me a basic overview on which ones you like and which ones you don't like. Well, I really like the pitch clock. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to like it, but I realize now um, I, I love it. Although I think it's added to um, pitching injuries, um, which, you know, we're, we've done a lot of research regarding the injuries we can talk about later, but um, I think it's really created more interest in the game. I, I know that when I'm watching a game now that, you know, it's just got more of my attention. I'm watching more baseball now than I've, I've watched in a long time. I've always watched it, but I find myself watching it more so now, enjoying it more so now. There's more, you know, stolen bases. Um, but I like the pitch clock a lot. Bigger bases I'm fine with. Uh, I think they should change the rule on the disengagements, you know, three throwovers at first base or a step off. I think that number should be four. I think it really could – just three could really deter a guy from even throwing over once. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, there's a huge increase in the amount of stolen bases. So I'd like to see them increase that to four. Um, the ghost runner, I understand why they're doing it. You know, I, I just – you know, I know it's good they're not doing it in the postseason, but I would hate to see the last game of the season, right, where two teams are tied and we're going right. to the 10th inning and there's a ghost runner – and all of a sudden there's a bad hop single or something, right? Mm. Uh, boy, that would hurt. So, but I understand why they're doing it to speed up the game, not just speed up the game, but save some pitching, right? You hate to go into those 15, 16 inning games, really, you know, utilize the bullpen, over overtax them, and also increase the risk of injury. Although, you know, the, the perception, which I'm going to argue big time, you know, that, uh, you know, if you're throwing too much, you, you know, you're more susceptible to injury. Well, certainly we don't want to throw more than we have to, but that's not the main reason for the for the injury epidemic. It's what's taking place in the brain, the brain body connection. And uh, okay. we've done the research on that. We've proven that. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a moment. I just want everybody to know that, buddy, that No Limits is being broadcast around the world. The audio version of the No Limits can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for a thousand subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? Going in the chat room is one way to do it. Or send your topic ideas to South Florida Tribune at gmail.com. If you want to advertise cost efficiently, give me a call at 954-304-4941. We broadcast live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Our website is www.southfloridatribune.com. My Twitter information is at Tribune South. Candy Ebling is behind the scene. And also, I should make a programming note that coming up later this summer, the Motor City Madmouth show will be debuting on the Egla Corp Media Studios in Boca Raton, owned by Dr. Edwin Hernandez. We'll keep you posted. This is a challenge, buddy, I'm looking forward to doing, that I'm building their media department from, broadcasting department from scratch. And wow. I was offered this position late last week, and I definitely took it, and I'm glad that hopefully we'll be able to bring you on there. I've already talked to him about it. And the reason why I talked to him about it, I had an opportunity to show him your video as we were going over some things there. So stay tuned, folks. Buddy and I could very well be on again, only on a different situation. All right, we'll continue on. Spe speaking of the video that I, I am referring to, buddy, it was his own motion video. Number one, you're in the video business. Got it right. A minute and 28 seconds. My goodness, I could get through that. Really good stuff. That was an impressive video. And Ken Bullrich, real quickly, buddy. Okay. He says, hello, Scott. Enjoyed watching the Royals back then. Well done, buddy. Look at the fans you got out Thank here. You. Thank you. All right. So let's go back to the fact that you refer to the 1985 World Series in most pressure pack games. You know, you talked about your career, you know, how you slowed things down. Why don't you just elaborate on everything that we talk about in that sequence? You talk about the 13 pro, 20 plus amateurs and uh, motion. I'll let you take the lead on this one since we talked about it before, about what you're sure. trying to get out of this own experience. Sure. So, you know, Scott, even though, <clears throat> even though I was a first round pick in 1978, I was just somewhat of a very marginal major league player. I could never really figure out how to stay in the lineup on a regular basis. However, I got in the world series in 85 and for whatever reason, everything just really slowed down for me and I wasn't thinking and really everything I did was just very fluid and effortless. And I choose my words very carefully when I say that every single ball at shortstop hit me right in the sweet spot in seven games. Right. And every single throw came out of my hand with perfect speed and trajectory. 
And it was that zone experience, what happened to my brain and my body that led me to researching and, and figuring a lot of things out about the brain body connection and teaching athletes, not just athletes, but musicians and even salespeople, how to get in the zone. And, um, you know, if you ask 100 athletes in any sport how they felt when they played their best, if they take the time to think about it, they will mention those three things. If things slowed down, they had more time, they weren't rushing, they weren't thinking, and the motion was more fluid and effortless. So we uh, have quantified what happens in the brain and more importantly, teach that. And we call it kind of the library of preparation. We all in life, we have these libraries of preparation. We do all the work, you know, and then boom, crunch time comes and we want to be able to access the library of preparation. Right. And so that's what we teach in, with zone motion. And I've worked with athletes in 13 professional sports, over 20 amateur sports and done five, five studies slash research pro uh, projects now. And so we've we've proven that zone motion is the only mental training program that increases performance. It's been proven to increase performance, expedite development, speed up the development and minimize soft tissue injuries, which is a very, very big thing um, in baseball, as we know, with pitchers. And I saw that little blurb that came across your screen here a moment ago about a, a gentleman who talked about the injuries, pitching injuries have increased. Yeah, I mean, that's that's impressive. You know what I found interesting um, about the reason they've increased. Oh, I'm sorry. What's that? No, I'm sorry. I was going to say I, the main, the main, the main reason. Things priority is the mechanic over the zone motion process. How information moves through the brain that allows all the muscles to fire synchronistically, therefore providing more fluid motion in the body. That creates a muscle imbalance. So as our industry, which has been great, they've learned more about quote perfect mechanics. However, when they've gone to teach them, right, we've seen an increase in injuries. And the reason is because the mechanic becomes the priority, that creates a muscle imbalance. And you combine that imbalance. Balance with the fact that these are more arm speed, that's a train wreck. That's what's happening. So we have to make the brain the priority in order to give an athlete the best chance of staying free of soft tissue injuries. Not just soft tissue tissue injuries, but injuries in general. Because what happens with this process, with the brain in the proper state, an athlete becomes more aware. They're more likely to avoid situations, make less unnecessary movement, or have less unnecessary movement, which will limit, reduce the chance of soft tissue injuries. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's yeah that that's, that. Yeah, that so is pretty interesting how you talk about that, too. You know, buddy, one of the things that intrigued me was you're able to build this concept off of your World Series experience. And you know what I also found intrigued when I was watching that video was I, I have an STP theory, buddy. It's slow down, think and proceed. And you know what? I began to develop some similarities with the STP theory with a lot of what you were doing. So are we that we were talking over each other. I just want to make sure the connection sounds so that we're able to get our entire message out. It doesn't happen. So continue on. Did you, did you say traumatic brain? I'm sorry. Brain injury there, I mean. Yeah, uh, what I've been saying is slow down, think it, proceed. It's the same thing. The STP motor oil. Yeah, a little bit. I, I, I go ahead and t uh, associate with that brain if you get my draft. Yeah. So, you know, I had, I had a brain injury as a kid as well and had him as an adult as well, yeah. which really, uh, made a lot of things very difficult for me to learn a lot about the brain and study a lot about the brain body connection, which has led to my teaching. So it's kind of life will give you some lemons and hopefully you turn them into lemonade and kind of that's, so, you know, I, I feel keen understanding not just maternally to be properly aligned so that their full ability can rise to the surface. So the motion that they've practiced right. that's in the library preparation, in the middle of the brain can be accessed. We want to access it. It's one thing, you know, being prepared, right? You're prepared, you're prepared. Then we have to access it. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of athletes work hard. They're, they're wonderful athletes, tremendous athletes. They understand what they need to do. And all of a sudden the lights go on and they're not able to access their full ability. And that's because the brain body connection is not working the way it can. They just don't quite understand it. It's not that they're mentally weak, right? A lot of people talk about mental weakness. I don't talk about mental weakness. Right. I talk about really understanding the brain. 
brain body connection and so makes sense the library preparation we want to access that library preparation when it's needed yeah you know amazingly you, you talk about that i've had a couple of concussions when it comes to head injuries so i can certainly relate about the traumatic effect of brain injuries for sure so so as we go on so i just want to make sure that we're up to speed on a little thing a few things i know You've worked with salespeople and musicians, right? I assume that that's an intricate part of what you're doing. A big part of, you know, I, primarily athletes, but I've done work in the sales world because I'd be working with executives on the golf course mm -hmm. and they'd say, you know, what you're, teach, what you're teaching applies to all of life. And so we developed or I developed a, a program to work with salespeople because we all know we've all been sold to in life before, right? Right. We've all kind of sold to a certain degree. And we know that when someone starts to nudge us or push us, it causes a little resistance. And then there's right. a lack of empathy in the relationship. A little distance occurs. Right. So what we're able to do is, is really give someone a neurophysiological experience of how that works. Okay. And then train them to make that state their, their default state. They become more connected to the person that they're, they're selling to or, or, or who is selling to them. Right. Okay. And the off the field um, um, benefit of, of zone motion, we've seen, you know, years ago, Scott, when I brought this out 16 years ago, yeah. I had no idea that it would have as much of an effect on a human as it. It does. I just saw one of them and then I started hearing saints and family members of theirs that they're just kind of had, they're happier, they're feeling better. Okay. Motion state. So we saw that there was an increase in theta, which actually increases serotonin oxytocin to feel good chemicals. Um, and across the board with a student athlete who's not benefited in the classroom as well. Because the brain, when the brain starts to access this state, you're intuitively always seeking it in all areas of life, not just while you're performing on the sports field, but whatever you're doing, whether you're in a relationship or whether you're, you know, studying for a test or taking a test. So if I'm understanding you correctly, I know this has a lot to do with athletes and you apply it to sales and musicians, because I know full well that anytime you have an eye octane situation of a lot of what you're talking about, because I know we talked about this before, you know, it's safe to say, it, I think a lot of what you're doing applies to multiple fields is really what it does. But I know your primary emphasis is on athletes. Is that correct? Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, we're primarily focused on athletes, but it does apply to to really all areas of life. Uh, but I, you know, I, you can't spread yourself too thin, nor should I. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I'm blessed to be able to work in multiple sports. I've decided that if I had to pitch, if I had to work just in one, one sport, I'd get bored now. So it's, it's really um, gratifying to work with athletes in, in many sports, primarily baseball, but I do a lot of work on the PGA tour, uh, a lot of amateur golfers and auto racers and basketball players. And so it's, it's been uh, a lot of joy for me every day to be doing what I do. So let's go a little bit deeper into the five studies or uh, of effectiveness of zone I think you talked about uh, Martin. Is that correct? Or zone motion, I meant. Zone motion. Zone, yeah, they're they're zone right. motion. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit more about that. So um, years ago, uh, at a time where pitching injuries were skyrocketing, I noticed that my professional and amateur pitching clients were not getting hurt. And I was kind of wondering why. And I, then I kind of figured out, well, if, they, if there's more fluid motion, which there was, um, that would make sense. And so I decided to try and do some research, which we ended up doing with the American Sports Medicine Institute, which is a research institute in Birmingham, Alabama, headed up by Dr. Glenn Fleisig, the top baseball biomechanist in the world. Um, this is where Dr. Andrews practices right. his orthopedic uh, sur sur surgery, um, has his practice down there in Birmingham. And he has the research clinic that Dr. Fleisig heads up. So I spoke to Dr. Fleissig about doing the study, which we ended up doing. We did it with 17 college pitchers, and it was uh, very, very successful. There was no change in the biomechanics of the 17 pitchers after training in zone motion, but the subjective experience was uh, was very profound uh, to the point where 
88% of them felt more relaxed, less shoulder discomfort, right. uh, much less elbow discomfort, all very, very positive. There, there, no one felt worse. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was very, very successful. And in the report, Dr. Fleisig wrote something that was very interesting. He, he wrote that even though there was no change in the biomechanics, it doesn't preclude the fact that there could be a change in the soft tissue, meaning that a pitcher could throw the same pitch twice in a row with the same mechanics, hmm. but the soft tissue, the ligaments and right. tendons and muscles and fascia could be different. And boom, that's when the light bulb went off in me. And I said, I know that's what zone motion does. And that's why our guys are, are you know, we're having great success in keeping them free of injury. And so that led to some EMG research, which was it's electromyography, where you measure right. the muscle voltage. Uh, and, we did, and we did small sample size. But what we saw was, and this was the, the, um, the work was analyzed by Dr. Kevin Witte, an orthopedic surgeon who does Tommy John surgery. And he also trained under Dr. Andrews. And Dr. Witte said that the zone motion process um, sh shows a decrease in the lat and an increase in the pec, mm -hmm. therefore showing more support for the shoulder. And therefore, we can assume the elbow is what he said. So that was very, very successful in, in, in you know, proving that what we're doing reduces soft tissue injuries. Right. And for years, we'd seen an increase in, you know, we used to call it life on the baseball. Now it's called spin rate. And so <clears throat> spin rate is a byproduct of really four things, arm strength and arm speed, mm -hmm. the proper kinetic chain of the body, proper mechanics. And, and last and most importantly is how the brain is functioning, getting signals through the brain to the cerebellum in a fashion that allows all the muscles to fire synchronistically. So the ball just comes out of the hand literally perfectly, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> all the muscles are firing synchronistically, and that's what allows an increase in spin rate. And we've seen through this through the research we did, we saw about a nine and a half percent increase in spin rate on four seam fastball. We I know clients have told me their their spin rate has increased more than that, and so um, that's kind of that's the and then well recently I did uh, a couple months ago just completed uh, heart rate research. It was it was seen there was a study done at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics on archers, in which they uh, measured the heart rate while they were performing. And what they saw was the reduced heart rate led to an increase in performance. And so I went ahead and did some small sample size research with four college baseball hitters, four baseball pitchers. And we saw a, a decrease after zone training of about a month and a half of training. We saw a decrease in heart rate of about 12 or 13% for the group, which, um, you know, which is what I expect. I expected to see a re reduction in heart rate. So, you know, as the heart rate subsides, in, in performance can increase. It doesn't mean it would ne definitely will increase, but with the proper training, it will increase. And, um, you know, a lot of a lot of professional sports are interested in, and teams are interested in, in heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is how quickly one can recover from a stressful event. So say a pitcher throws uh, – you know, four balls in a row creates a little stress in the system. Right. You know, how quickly can you get back on target, right? That's very, very important. And what I've told teams is, you know, heart rate variability is great. It's wonderful. I love it. It needs to be worked on. But what's more important is what's taking place with the heart during the motion. That's mm -hmm. how you avoid the four walk, the, the four ball walk, where you don't have to be as concerned with HRV. Let's take care of what's happening right here in this moment, okay, that keeps the heart rate down, that allows for fluid motion, increased spin rate, Reduce chance of soft tissue injury. You get the point, right? All right. Wanna, so, want to know what the heart's doing in the moment. So, when we put your research, buddy, in perspective, okay, I know we've got a lot to chew on here. What is it the one thing that you want most people to take away from all the research that you've done on zone motion? Or two things. Well, the, the main thing is that zone motion, right, increases performance, expedites development and reduces the chance of soft tissue injury. Now, you, you, if I tell a scientist that, he looks at all my research, he's gonna say, this is hogwash because it's not peer reviewed research. And I'm gonna say, you're right. It's not peer reviewed research, but I, which I don't care about. You know, we just care about helping the players, right? We care about helping the players, helping the teams and, and keeping the players as healthy as they possibly can be, right? right? There are a lot of careers that are ending because People are more focused on velocity and mechanics, which are very, very important. I'm a huge fan of velocity and mechanics. 
but not at the expense of the way the brain functions, right? right? We want to make sure the brain is in the right state. And then you go to turn up velocity and you go to integrate the proper mechanics and which we teach the integration process, right? Coaches don't have to do anything different. The players just need to be in the zone when they're working on, when they're developing and, and, and performing. Okay. So what I'm going to do here, and I know this is a really interesting subject. It really is. When we put things in perspective, we talk about the methodology that is backed by science is what we talked about, right? Correct? Yes. And then we talk about the that it expedites development, enhances performances, minimizes soft tissue injuries, and only significantly prevent mental training program. Is, is that correct is, when we summarize that per perspective? I wouldn't say it's the only significant mental training program. It's the only mental training program that I know of that has been proven to do all of those things. We can use technology to prove everything that I've, I've stated through EMG, okay. spin rate, and the length of time it takes to develop and make changes for an athlete to make those mechanical changes that an athlete often needs to make. Okay, I got some good comments in chat. You're ready for these. These are really, really good, buddy. George Icor, what do you think is wrong with the mental situations facing players like Tigers outfielder Austin Meadows? Okay, I'm not familiar with what he's going through right now. Um, if they want to expand on that, I can comment. Okay. Next thing. All right, George. I'll expand on it. Well, do you think any athletic tra trainers on a big league level in baseball or in other sports, buddy, that you, do you work with any of them? No, I, I, I work with the athletes. Um, I'm open to consulting with teams. We're going to make that part of our, our model. Um, they're teams that have been very interested for a long time. I think they, you know, in the scientific world, people are very concerned about peer reviewed studies which I don't have yet and probably not going to do anytime soon. We may, we may do a little more research. Uh, we're open to uh, team sponsored research, uh, which we would love to do. Well, Vogel, do you ever, did you ever consider getting back into MLB or minor league baseball as a manager hitting coach or something else? Yeah, very, I'm very interested in, in, in helping a club um, access the zone so that they can, again, speed development up and, and enhance performance and, and minimize soft tissue injury. So um, I'm, I'm extremely interested in, in consulting with teams in that capacity, for sure. One of the things that was really impressive about your website, and folks, you really, you'll really you have an opportunity, buddy, to mention it at the, on the back end of the show. But one of the things that really amazed me was the testimonials that you had. I'm going to mention some of the ones that stood out to me. One, George Brett, you talked about helping him on the driving range, which is pretty good. I don't like he needs any help with his spring on his swing anyways. But you had George Brett. Adam Otavio of the Mets. I'm just going to list them, and then you tell me the ones that stood out. Jeremy Afelt of the San Francisco Giants. Austin Davis of the Boston Red Sox. You helped Matt Cain with the San Francisco Giants. He had a perfect game. That was one that really, really stood out. Brad Markey of the Chicago Cubs. Mental, mechanical sides of pitching. Jake Patrika and Milwaukee Brewers. Charlie Hoffman, four-time PGA Tournament winner. Dr. Stacy Bocino. Morris Lukowicz of the Winnipeg Jets is retired. Scott McCarron, PGA Senior Tour Director, was re rediscovering his youth on the Senior Tour. And then you also mentioned Benny. All right, I mentioned a lot. Tell me the ones that stood out in your mind and what you were able to do. Yeah, um, well, Scott McCarron is a great one because Scott came to me right when he turned 50 years old. He was going on the Senior PGA Tour and Scott was a, a guy who had done a lot of good things in his career, not just, you know, on the course, but in caring for himself. He was kind of, I, would, I look at Scott as being a kind of a non-problem case. You know, it wasn't like there was, he was going through a, a you know, a really difficult mental uh, situation. He was just going on the senior tour and wanted every advantage he could get. So we worked together and he ended up winning 11 tournaments in the next four years, over nine and a half million dollars. 11 golf tournaments he won in four years. That was a great one. Um, another story that uh, that I love was one of my first major league pitchers. One of my first. Worked with was a guy by the name of Bobby Keppel. It's kind of a sandwich pick by the New York Mets many years ago. Okay. And got to AAA, a few cups of coffee in the big leagues, but was really struggling in AAA to the point he had of a, he had a 5-4-5 five, five ERA over the course of four seasons in AAA. And it decided to retire and go to work for his father's landscaping business. Mm -hmm. And his agent called me 
and said, hey, Bobby Keppel just got an invitation to go to the Twins Major League Camp, and he's thinking about giving it one more chance. Would you work with him? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do so. And so we worked together, and he went and had a pretty good spring training and was sent to AAA where he ended up having a 2-4-5 ERA, three points below his four-year career average in AAA. Wow. Got called to got called up to the Minnesota Twins, and his first 14 and the third innings were scoreless. And then his first major league win, listen to this, came in game 163, not 162, 163. It was a one one game playoff with the Detroit Tigers. Oh, to see who was going to represent that. that division in the playoffs. He got the win. They sold his contract to Japan. He went and made about three million dollars over the course of the next three years. He was going from a landscaping job to putting $3 million in his pocket the next three years. Basically came out of retirement. That's a story that I just absolutely love. Yeah, And well, I love this. I love the Brad Markey story, although Brad is a retired minor league pitcher. Brad was another non-problem case, really solid human, yeah. solid individual, was stuck in extended spring training. He was a 5'10 right-handed pitcher. And if you know anything about pitching, 5'10 right-handed pitchers, the, 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 uh, the deck is stacked against them every day they go on the field. Really? But Brad, who was a solid guy, I actually knew him in high school. And he called me and said, I think you can help me. And we worked together. And a few weeks later, he got moved to A ball out of extended spring training, did extremely well. Uh, a few weeks later, he got moved to high A ball and finished the year there and ended up with the second lowest whip in all of baseball behind Clayton Kershaw. No kidding. Right? That's a non problem case. Now, quite often, people think that what I do is for a quote, a problem case, someone with the yips. Or right. someone who's quote mentally weak or whatever it is, that's not what zone motion is about. Zone motion is for any athlete who wants to access their full ability in any given moment. Every athlete wants that. I certainly did. I had no idea how to do it. I was out of the major leagues. I was out of the major leagues 20 months after my zone experience in the World Series because I didn't know what happened to my mind and body that allowed me to play so well. You bring up that game 163. That was painful, man. I'm telling you. Oh, well, you were tired of it. You well, remember that. I write about the Tigers. Come on. But yeah, you know right. what, though? I'm going to get throw one at you. This is really good. You ready? Ken Ball right. There has to be something different because Mickey Lolich won three of the World Series games for the Tigers in the 1968 World Series. How do you describe that one? Yeah, right. So, you know, back in those days, right, we, we, didn't, we didn't know a lot about mechanics. Let's talk about pitching, right? We just didn't know a lot about pitching mechanics. They weren't really taught, right? And so guys really stayed free of injury. But again, the more we've learned about mechanics and gone to teach them as an, as an industry, injuries have increased. Now, does that mean that mechanics should not be taught? Absolutely not. Mechanics should be taught, but they need to be taught with the brain in the right state so right. that we can have a better chance of staying free of injury and so that we can progress more quickly as well and perform better. So yeah. huge fan of mechanics. But you're right. Back in those days, Mickey Loach – you know, if you ask Mickey Lowe's to really break down all his mechanics, probably couldn't do it. He said, I just threw the ball and would be my guess. I don't know well, that. All right, so let me throw this out. Do you think Mickey Lowe's belongs in the Baseball Hall of Fame? I don't know enough about his numbers. You got That's that's the question. I'm going to turn I'm going to turn that back to you. Does he? I, I personally do, because number one, you know, he threw a lot of complete games back there. He was an innings eater. And he also had to deal with a league when it was in the, with a designated hitter, which you all think all about. I don't right. know if his numbers, since they're below two and a half, two fifty, allow him to get there. But my buddy Tom Gage wrote a book on him, and I've always, and I've actually buddy had him on my show before. I've he's been my he's my idol anyhow. I think he does, but that's subject. And you know, I'm being a yeah. Tigers guy like I am. You know, how many heart, wins did he have? Huh? How many wins did he have? I think. 200 and i don't know off the top of my head under 230 i believe yeah so he he didn't make the 250 mark is all i can tell you but if you right. go out there and okay well let's go ahead and let bill vogel mention this do you think don manning belongs in the hall of fame you know again with, without looking at the numbers right in front of me um i i can't answer on a really well some players i probably could answer on I mean, Donnie, I mean, Donnie really was a, a great player. He really took advantage of Yankee Stadium, I can tell you that. You know, that yeah. short right field porch. And he was such, first of all, he's such a great first baseman. Um, but that short right field porch, he could really take the ball inside, inside off the corner and really stay inside that better than any hitter in that era. 
and and hit that you know hit the ball down the line for a home run. So he uh, he benefited by playing Yankee Stadium. I think he benefited by being a Yankee. I think anybody who plays for the Yankees gets a lot more publicity, right? And um, but he was a great player. I don't know enough about his numbers, overall numbers, to say yes for sure he belongs in, in the Hall of Fame. All right, one other question, then I want to allow you to summarize everything and put it in perspective, okay? How did you like playing at the old Yankee Stadium? No place like it, Scott. Yeah. I've always said there's there's the big leagues and then there's old Yankee Stadium. Yeah. You know, I, I saw mean, one it? game there. I paid a lot of money there last year against the Tampa Bay Rays. It was worth it just to go there once, but go ahead, continue. Yeah, there was no place like uh, playing at Yankee Stadium. It was a completely different environment. Um it was just, you know, the, the, the history there, um, Bob Shepard, right. In those days, the right. PA announcer, uh, you know, playing New York, New York after the final out, um, just so many wonderful things and, and just, you know, being in the city, right. Being in the, the energy of New York, um, and playing baseball, Yankee stadium. I mean, there's just no trip like it in baseball. All right. So when you look at your career, buddy, what would you say the highlight of it? I know what it was a little brief, but would you say, give me the highlight as to what it was like on the field? Because I have an idea what the highlight was off. Go ahead. Well, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, you know, winning the world series in, in 85 um, was by far the highlight of my professional career. You know, as a kid, I never, again, I never thought about playing the world series and even when I got to the major leagues, I couldn't really fathom playing the World Series. It was kind of too big an event. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I found myself playing the World Series. Yeah. And not only that, I played the best baseball of my professional career. Felt like I couldn't do anything wrong, and that was the benefit of you know entering the zone just by chance. And now you know we teach it by design. So, um, but that was uh, just an amazing overall experience, amazing time in my life. The, the opportunities that came from it, being on David Letterman and the Today Show and right. being on Kansas City Magazine and just, you know, all, all the opportunities. Um, but really, I feel very blessed that 20, 20 months later, I was out of the big leagues, but I've really, you know, utilized that experience to figure out, okay, what happened in the World Series? And more importantly, how do I teach it? You know, so that all of us, we all, we all want to be the best we can be in life, right? Whether we're an athlete or whatever we're doing. And so my expertise is helping an athlete be the best they can be. And, and I just love doing it, love changing lives. Well, you bring up an interesting point. But I want to assume that obviously one of the highlights of your career is that you were able to use a World Series as your platform to do things with its own motion. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, what that, so my follow up to that are, is when you look at the show that we've done today, what do you want to get the most out of this whole thing that you want to convey to everybody that has a chance to listen to it one or two times? A great question. Yeah. The thing, um, none of us know, we don't know. Right. And the key is to really be open to better ways, being open to what you don't know, what you can't see and what you may not remember that you forgot. And so again, a lot of people think that, zone motion is for quote problem cases. No, the brain is the operating system to the muscles. And so we work with the brain on the field so that the athlete can start to change the neural pathways in the brain and therefore affect the muscles. When you change the neural pathways in, in the brain and you make what we call the zone motion process, the priority, the default state for the brain, that's when you start to experience the game as slowing down and not thinking in fluid effortless motion. So that's what I would love people to understand. Okay. So one thing I should ask you, what other major shows have you been invited on to talk about what you're doing? I Did I mention, uh, you just tell me what they are. If I can recall. So the Major League Baseball Network, I was on several years ago talking about this. Um, you know, been on plenty of podcasts and, and um, <clears throat> Baseball America did a story on me. Um I can't, I can't remember, you know, just uh, we've got a new book coming out uh, probably beginning of next year called Art of the Zone. Very excited about that. Well, well um, I'll, I'll make sure there's room for you to promote that. Mark my word. We'll definitely you're a good man, that. Scott. Appreciate you. Well, you are too. So what I want you to do now, buddy, is let everybody know how they get a hold of you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, they can uh, they can go to zonemotion.com and they can send me an email at buddy, B-U-D-D-Y, at zonemotion.com. Very good. So there you go. 
there that's not, now i should also point out that once again no limits is being broadcast around the world the audio version of this show can be heard on iheart radio apple spotify google wherever you get your podcast please hit the red subscribe button on youtube south florida tribune we're striving for a thousand subscribers please also comment like and share the broadcast want to be a guest no problem we got a bunch of people that participate in the chat room that will very well have an opportunity to do that participate in the chat room or please send your topic ideas south florida tribune at gmail.com if you want to advertise cost efficiently call me 954-304-4941 we broadcast live on facebook LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, website, www.southflorida.tribune.com, Twitter, at Tribune South. Candy Ebling is behind the scenes. Coming up later this summer, the Motor City Mad Mouse Show will be debuting on Egla Corp Media Studios in Boca Raton, Florida, owned by Dr. Edwin Hernandez. We'll keep you posted. I have been named the director of broadcasting for the company, and part of the agreement was I, I'd have my own show, and that's something I'm looking forward to doing. And I think it's really important, too, that, you know, when you talk about something as unique as this one is here, buddy, I'm just so glad we had an opportunity to get this out there. And I should point out, though, that when I mentioned LinkedIn, I had the good fortune of meeting Buddy Biancolana on LinkedIn. So for those of you in the professional business, get out there and get on LinkedIn. So, buddy, I want to thank you very much for joining us on tonight's edition of No Limits. Any last thing you want to add? No, just uh, I appreciate you, Scott. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, yes, we met on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great platform. I encourage people to to go to LinkedIn. And I'd love to connect with more people on LinkedIn. So if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, please do so at Buddy Biancolana. Very good. Well, you have a great story. And I think the one thing about it is you have something that so many people don't realize. And I think the most important thing, Buddy, that's important is we let everybody go out there and make bring awareness to it. And I'll do everything in my power to diligently promote it. Go ahead. Can I also mention to connect with me on Instagram? That would be great. Absolutely. Mention okay. everything. Well, yeah, you know, well, for that matter, mention Twitter. And tw I'm on Twitter and Instagram, yes. That a boy. You got okay. it. Might as well do it. So, so meanwhile, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this edition of No Limits. On behalf of Buddy Biancolana, the 1985 world champion for the Kansas City Royals, got a ring. Got to get that in there. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Mad Mouth. Thank you for joining us, and we will catch you on tomorrow night. We have a doubleheader, 108 Stitches Baseball Talk, and – Inside the Pixel. Good night, everybody.